Welcome everybody to the January 20, 28th, January 28, 2003 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, my name is David Backer. Um, quick roll call of members and we have new uh, members with us tonight. Uh, Jay Chapmas. Uh, Joseph Guglielmetti, Here. new board member, uh, Jack Keneally, Present. Stephen LaPlante, Here. Gib Mendelson, Here. Michael Tranfaglia. We have a full board, mem board uh, compliment and we welcome Mr. Mendelson and Mr. Guglielmetti to the board. The first item on our agenda tonight is the annual election of officers, which is required by Section 1 of the Cape Elizabeth Rules and Regulations of the Zoning Board of Appeals. And we are required annually to elect a chair and secretary from among our members. I'd like to have the pleasure of nominating David Backer as chair. I will second that nomination. Other motions for chair? Hearing none, discussion on the motion? All those in favor? <clears throat> and I will abstain. Um, and the motion is carried by a vote of six in favor, uh, zero opposed. Uh, with one abstention and thank you board members for your confidence and I will once again do my best to continue to earn that confidence. Um, we next need a motion for the election of the board secretary for the upcoming year. I nominate Mr. Keeley. Keneally, excuse me. Motion by Mr. LaPlante uh, to elect Mr. Keneally. I'll second that. Uh, second, any other motions to be made? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion? Abstain. Opposed? Abstain. One abstention by Mr. Keneally. The motion is approved by a vote of six in favor, zero opposed. Um, we will move on to the next item on the agenda, which is approval of the minutes of September 24, 2002. These are minutes that were carried over from our last meeting. And any comments? Well, first of all, could I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Uh, motion, Mr. Keneally. Second. Second. Second, Mr. Tranfaglia. Uh, discussion on the motion, any comments? Hearing none, all those in favor of approval of the minutes as submitted? Opposed? The motion is approved, five in favor, zero opposed, with abstentions from Mr. Guglielmetti and Mr. Mendelson, uh, neither of whom uh, were on the board in September. Uh, second item on the agenda is to approve the minutes of our October 22, 2002 meeting. And there are only two of us on the board tonight who are present at that meeting, uh, Dr. Chapmas um, and I. I only have one comment on the minutes. Uh, maybe a question. Bruce, do you have a copy of these? Well, I have. On the first page, on line 39, it refers to, uh, well, line 39 says, the lot was considered non-conforming at the time the ordinance was adopted and 1.1% was subsequently grandfathered. A few lines down on line 44, it refers to 1.8%. Um, 
I think those numbers should be consistent, Please either 1.1 or 1.8. I think it was 1.8, but I'm not entirely sure. Could we, I don't know what you'd like to do. Would you like to approve and then change it to what the records reflect? Sure, I was thinking that it was, um, <clears throat> I was thinking that it was 1.1, but I really don't remember. It may have been. I, I don't know, but I think the number should be the same, whichever it is. So I guess I'd like to suggest that we approve them with a request that the recording secretary, Barbara, check the records to see whether it should be 1.1 or 1.8 and print the final version with whatever was presented at the, based on the submissions at the October meeting. Dr. Chapman, is that okay with you? Yes. So we have unanimity for approval of the October 22 minutes. So moved. Second, all those in favor? Approved. Next item on the agenda is old business, and we have none that I am aware of, which takes us to the next item on the agenda, new business. And the first item of new business is to hear the administrative appeal of David Wenberg and Ann Carney of the Code Enforcement Officer's decision to issue a certificate of occupancy number 030034 for a structure addition on lot five of map U41 at 133 Two Lights Road. Are Mr. Winberg and Ann Carney here? Good evening, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jonathan Brogan. I'm an attorney representing Dr. Winberg and Ms. Carney in this appeal, as well as the second issue on the agenda, which is the uh, request by their neighbors to uh, put a business uh, within the uh, accessory structure that we're going to talk about here tonight. The, the appeal is uh, laid out within the uh, administrative appeal form that has been filed by Ms. Carney and Dr. Wenberg, which states specifically what they are concerned about. Their concern is clear and it is based upon the fact that a separate building has been built on a lot of their neighbors. That separate building has now been called a structure addition by the code enforcement officer when in fact this is an accessory building. Uh, we laid out in a letter uh, to your attorney, Mr. Hill, a uh, dateline or a uh, timeline showing exactly how this actually took place and what exactly our concerns are with what has happened so far. What has happened is that a separate building was built on the Winberg and Carney's neighbor's lot. Uh, when it was ini initially uh, presented, it was presented as a uh, 28 by 36 accessory building, not to be, uh, to, to be used for storage and personal office space, not to be used as a business office. <clears throat> as you know, the, uh, according to the attorney for uh, the Wenberg's neighbors, uh, Ms. Evans and her husband, uh, they immediately informed the code enforcement officer, Mr. Smith, that in fact, the building was not going to be an accessory structure, that it was going to be integrally connected to their house through the use of a walkway. And the, the specific language was, according to the, another letter sent by Mr. Bannon, who was representing uh, Mr. Sellers and Ms. Evans, dated December 3rd, he's, he says on the, on the third page of that letter, which I'm hopeful that all of you have, uh, that they asked for a building permit. They asked for a construct to construct 28. No, wait, by, if I could just interrupt you, which letter are you referring to? This is the December 3rd, 2002 letter of Mr. Bannon to Mr. Hill. Okay, we do. I think we all have that letter. Does everyone have that? That is the letter that 
came subsequent to the receipt of the initial packet. Okay, I think we do all have that. Thank you. Uh, at the bottom of the second page, the last full paragraph, it explains that the, uh, it was explained to the CEO that this was a attached structural addition rather than an accessory building. And on the next page it says, and I'll quote it, the choice of wording is deliberate. When the CEO originally typed up the building permit, and you all should have a copy of that original building permit, it, he described it as an accessory structure. My clients immediately brought to Mr. Smith's attention that the barn-like addition would actually be connected to their existing home by means of a covered and closed walkway. Now, I don't know uh, whether Mr. Bannon simply misunderstood what his clients told him or, in fact, it was reported to Mr. Smith that a covered and closed walkway would be connected between the house building and this barn accessory building. In fact, that is not what happened. I'm representing to the board that that's my uh, understanding and misunderstanding of the facts. Uh, as I just learned that long after this building permit was uh, Mr. Bannon, um, unfortunately, in order for you to be picked up on television and recording, you're going to need to speak into the microphone. So what I'd like to request, though, is that you wait until uh, Mr. Brogan is finished with his presentation, and then you'll have an opportunity to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, I, I don't know whether that was a misunderstanding on Mr. Bannon's part uh, when he wrote to Mr. Hill, or in fact it was reported to Mr. Smith that there would be a covered and closed walkway. There certainly is not a covered and closed walkway. There is a, uh, a uh, I don't even know how to describe it, I guess it's a, uh, an extension, it's not even, it's a walkway from the house to the barn which is open to the air. There is no way to get from the house to the barn-like structure without going outside. And in fact, underneath, my understanding is that underneath this walkway, there are no doorways. There's a, there's a walkway which is approximately six to 10 feet above the ground. You have to walk from the house building to the barn building outside and then walk into a door into this barn building. Now what has concerned Ms. Wenberg and Doc, uh, Dr. Wenberg and Ms. Carney is exactly how this whole uh, situation evolved. As you can see from the initial application, the initial application says that it's, in a, uh, it's an accessory structure. After the owners of the building then report to Mr. Smith that they're going to use this uh, covered and closed walkway, he changes it to an attached structure, which in fact it is not an attached structure. The only thing between the two buildings is this open walkway. And it says specifically in the building permit not to be used as a business office. On October 22, 2002, a certificate of occupancy was uh, granted by the CEO. And it said that the new building was additional living space to the single family dwelling. I know all of you are familiar with the, the residential uh, zone that the uh, all of these homes are in, and it's a residential A zone. Therefore, there are significant restrictions on any sort of use of a residential A zone building for business. The next thing that happens after the certificate of occupancy is issued is that apparently there's a conversation between Mr. Smith and uh, Ms. Evans, in which Ms. Evans informs Mr. Smith that she is already using this building that was represented on the building uh, permit not to be used for a business as a business for her, uh, I, I believe she's a graphic artist, for her graphic art business. So she has moved from a conditional use permit that was given to her back in April of 2001 to in October of 2002, moving the business from her home to this barn-like structure, setting up business in there in, without asking the board for an additional permit, and then telling the CEO that she, in fact, is doing business in there. Mr. Smith properly informed her that that was inappropriate, that she couldn't do that, that she needed to reapply for a conditional use permit. That has now happened, uh, and in fact, the, the application by Ms. Evans was done on January 14, 2003. The appeal that we have taken is to the 
CEO's characterization of this building as an additional dwelling space for a single family unit. It is not. It is, it looks like it was specifically designed for the purpose of Ms. Evans running her business. That is inappropriate in a residential A zone. What should have happened is that they should have come to you for a permit with the building permit saying this is going to be a business in a separate building. In fact, what happened is a separate building was built. It was attached in a uh, fashion to the other building, but not in a fashion that makes it part of the building, but is still an accessory building that has a walkway in between, a walkway that you're open to the outdoors. And now they come to you after they've moved their business in there and say, look, the business is here. We need a conditional use permit. We think that's inappropriate. We're asking that the board overturn the uh, finding of the CEO that this is in fact a uh, additional living space. Find it to be an accessory building. The, uh, the zoning ordinances of the, of, the, of the town specifically state that if it is an accessory building, it cannot be used as a business. That is the, the, the nut of the, uh, the whole portion of my argument. I'd be happy to answer any questions or concerns that the board has. Uh, I know there are other uh, neighbors here who have similar concerns and may want to express them, and obviously I'll leave that to the chairman to decide how that is uh, taken up. Okay. Well, we actually have, we have two, obviously, interrelated matters <laughs> before us tonight, and I'd like to make sure that we're addressing them in the right order procedurally. Um, and you know, I know, Mr. Bannon, that you have a reply that you'd like to make, especially as to the procedural stance of where we are. Um, so why don't, why don't we hear that at this point? <clears throat> I guess the board realizes uh, I'm John Bannon and I'm speaking here tonight on behalf of Leslie Evans and Ronnie Sellers. Um, I have a lot I'd like to say about the content of the uh, information that was given to you a few minutes ago, but I need to start with the procedure by which we come here tonight and to get that squared away because in fact, the appellants have gone far beyond what they can argue on this appeal. This is an administrative appeal from a certificate of occupancy. The uh, appellants could have appealed from the issuance of the building permit. Everybody has 30 days to appeal from the granting of a building permit if they don't like it. That didn't happen. So that anything that was decided by the code enforcement officer in the context of issuing that building permit isn't before this board. The board doesn't have jurisdiction to consider that on this administrative appeal. The only issue that this board could decide on this administrative appeal is whether the building that Leslie Evans and Ronnie Sellers built materially differed from the building permit that Mr. Smith issued for that building. You have not heard any allegations, let alone evidence, thus far tonight from the appellants that there was any discrepancy whatsoever between the building permit that, that Mr. Smith issued uh, and the building as built. I know that these people would like to talk about a lot of different issues, but again, we must remember that the only issue before us tonight on this appeal is, is the house as built materially different from the building permit? If it is, then the certi certificate of occupancy shouldn't have been granted. But if it is substantially the same, and you've heard no evidence to the contrary, then you must affirm, because the certificate of occupancy was given correctly. That is the procedural issue uh, that I'd like to start with, and I don't know whether the board wants to resolve that first or get on to the substance. Um, I think we should resolve the procedural issue first before we get on to the substance of the rest of the argument. Very good. Um, would you like to address the, uh, well, or maybe you, you already have to the extent that you think it needs to be addressed, the, um, <coughs> the Salisbury uh, yes, uh, issue? Yes, I, I would be glad to do that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hill and I have somewhat different views, although I don't think that they matter terribly much tonight. 
It's my position that based on Salisbury, the issue of whether this is an attached building or not, or whether it's an accessory structure or not, is not before the board at all. What the Salisbury case says is that if you wait until the certificate of occupancy to bring an appeal, you can't challenge anything about the validity of the building permit. It's just too late to do that. That's what Salisbury says loud and clear. A certificate of occupancy is something that you can appeal. I'm not saying that it isn't. But the types of things you can argue if all you appeal is a certificate of occupancy are very narrow. And that is what I was stating earlier. That is to say, the only issue you can raise in such an appeal is whether the building as built differs from the building permit as granted. But I submit to the board that under Salisbury and other cases that preceded it, including Wright versus Town of Kenny Bunkport, there is no longer in front of this board to decide whether this building is attached or not, whether it's an accessory structure or not. Those are things that Mr. Smith decided when he reviewed the application for the building permit. He made those determinations then. He issued a building permit that said that this was for an attached structure, not for an accessory structure. He stated it was for an addition for a dwelling unit. I submit to the board that those issues are no longer in front of you to decide because the appellants missed the deadline for appealing from the building permit. Do you acknowledge that those issues should properly come up during the course of your client's request for a conditional use permit? It is my contention, and I know that Attorney Hill disagrees with this, that because those issues are foreclosed from being brought on this administrative appeal, that is to say, because it's no longer subject to question whether this is an accessory use or an attached structure or whether it's a dwelling unit and so forth, it can't be brought up even on the conditional use appeal or conditional use application. It's too late to do that then as well because under the doctrine of administrative res judicata, which is a bunch of Latin that basically means that once something is settled, it's settled. It's my interpretation of the law that once the building permit became final after 30 days, all of those issues became settled for all purposes, not just for this administrative appeal, but also for the purposes of determining whether my clients were entitled to a conditional use permit. So just to make sure that I understand, I'm looking for a copy of the building permit. Was that in our packet, the actual building permit? I don't know if I supplied one. I don't believe I did. Maybe I did. You did. If the board has a copy of my December 3rd letter, then you'd have a copy of the building permits as well. They were attached as exhibits. And the building permit in question would be exhibit C, if you have the packet that I'm referring to. So it's your position that once Mr. Smith issued the building permit, granting authority to construct a structure with attached walkway to dwelling, and no appeal was taken within 30 days, that the argument is closed as to whether the structure is in fact attached or not. Correct, Your Honor. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I'm used to dealing with courts, but I hope you don't mind the honor. Mr. Chairman, in exhibit C, what my clients were given permission to do was to construct an attached structure to be used for storage and personal office space, not to be used as a business office. I did want to interject something here about that language about not to be used as a business office. 
The reason that's in there is that we have always known that in order to put a home business in that addition, we need to come before this board for a conditional <coughs> use application and, and approval. Well, I don't think I'm looking at the building permit. Okay. Um, if the board doesn't actually have this, I have lots of copies of my letter. These have been collated with uh, some of the letters that have been afterwards, but I'd, if the board would like to see the... Just let me know what the chairman would like to do. Well, you were just reading something from the building permit that seemed to be inconsistent with what we're looking at. All right, now I um, see what you're looking at then. Well. Well, there's approval, and then there's a building placket. This is approval. What, what, what is the... That's the placket. That's the Th approval. This is the actual permit. That's the approval. Okay. I was looking at something else. No problem. And as you can see from uh, this permit, uh, permit approval for permit number 020639, my clients were given permission to construct an attached structure. Now, my clients had been to Mr. Smith before, or, or at the time that they were applying for this permit, they described exactly what they were going to do with the building, what the purposes for their use of the building were. They described the walkway. And by the way, that's my mistake, not the client's mistake, um, whether it was covered or not. I just did not get that straight when I was writing that letter. That is not my client's fault at all. Uh, but my clients did describe the, the, pro the project accurately to Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, in, in evaluating this information, decided that what they were describing was an attached structure, and he granted a building permit for that purpose. Having done that, and there being no appeal from this approval on Exhibit C within the 30 days allotted, whatever is Put, set forth in this approval is true, uh, whether it's accurate or not, under Maine law. If it's not appealed, it becomes true. We think it's true as a matter of fact he, as well, but it's simply too late for anyone to challenge at this point that what they plan to build was an attached structure. And uh, for that reason, that issue is not subject to debate here tonight under any circumstance. Okay, thank you. May I address that? Um, that specific what, what, issue. Sure. I, I think it's fascinating that the, the permit is being used as sort of a, a stop for anything that the neighbors want to do about what has happened since then. But if you look at the permit itself, it says that it's not to be used as a business office. And now the neighbors are coming to you and saying they're going to use it as a business office, but that we cannot challenge either the certificate of occupancy, which calls this an attached building when it isn't an attached building, and that we, because we are foreclosed from a cha challenging the certificate of occupancy, that we cannot challenge the conditional use because the conditional use is subsumed in the CEO's original finding that this is not an accessory structure, but an attached structure. It uh, not only puts justice on its head, it puts uh, common sense on its head. Uh, we have two issues here. The first is, was the CEO's certificate of occupancy, which says that this is an accessory structure, correct? We say it is not. Mr. Bannon says it is. Even if that is decided one way or the other by the board, there is a second issue. If you accept Mr. Bannon's argument that this building permit is the be-all and end-all of everything that is going to be decided here today, it seems to me that the second issue was easily decided. There should not be a business in that building because it was not approved as part of the building permit. Therefore, it cannot be brought again to the board. That was his argument concerning 
the res judicata effect of the building permit and the CEO's decision. So if, in fact, Mr. Bannon's argument is, look, this is conclusive, this is res judicata, you accept this argument that what the CEO found, and uh, as you know, it's, there were two different building permits issued. Uh, the first one, again, was signed by Mr. Smith on July 1st, and then there's some handwriting on here, and I'm not sure if that's Mr. Smith's handwriting or someone else's handwriting, but it says expansion of the existing uh, structure, 7802. That was Exhibit D to our letter of January 27, 2003. It's not my handwriting. It's not your handwriting. Someone's handwriting on there. <coughs> uh, but that's, that's the building permit that says accessory structure. The second building permit on the same day says attached structure. And again, Mr. Bannon says that uh, his clients uh, explained to Mr. Smith that this uh, open walkway would be the only attachment between the two buildings. And from that, Mr. Smith decided that, in fact, this was not an accessory structure, but an attached structure. Be that as it may, you can't have it both ways. If the building permit forecloses any argument about what the building permit says, then the issue of whether there should be a conditional use in that building should be over as well. If it in fact does not, as we have argued, then both these issues are live before the board. And we believe that the issue of jurisdiction under the Salisbury case is within your purview, within the board's purview, that it is not foreclosed. <laughs> and that Mr. Smith's, with all due respect, uh, Mr. Smith's uh, uh, certificate of occupancy is just incorrect, whether it's incorrect based on uh, his view of the building or it's incorrect on his view of the law, it's incorrect. And that there should not be a conditional use permit issued for this separate structure in a uh, separate building because it goes against the zoning ordinance of the town of Cape Elizabeth. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Brogan. Mr. Hill. Sir, okay. I would request a short opportunity to respond to well, it, it, maybe we could hear, hear from Mr. Hill first, because you may very well want to respond to him also. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Michael Hill, uh, town attorney. I believe everyone has my December 11 letter, which responds to uh, Mr. Bannon's December 3rd letter and addresses the uh, jurisdictional issue. I agree with Mr. Bannon that uh, the board's review of this matter is limited to whether the construction on the face of the earth uh, complied with what was approved. And if it substantially uh, complies with the building permit, then the certificate of occupancy was properly issued. If it uh, went beyond the scope of the building permit, then it was inappropriate to issue the certificate of occupancy. And that's what this board has to focus on on this administrative appeal. Uh, the board may be interested to hear from Mr. Smith as to uh, what was the scope of the um, elevated walkway. I'm not sure exactly what to talk, what to call uh, that, that walkway, but uh, if that was beyond the scope of the building permit, if the, if the uh, building was built in an imp uh, improper location, those are the types of issues that the board has jurisdiction to hear. The board, uh, it, it, Mr. Bannon is correct, it's not an opportunity for someone to get a second bite at the apple for the issuance of the permit. I would like to address the legal significance in the permit approval uh, that describes the structure as an attached structure. It's my opinion that uh, the board should not place legal significance on Mr. Smith's use of the word attached in, um, in that that approval or in the certificate of occupancy. And the reason I say that the board should not place legal significance on that is that that determination as to whether the building was attached or not was not critical to the issuance of the permit. If it were a factor 
that was critical to the issuance of the permit, then, then I would agree with Mr. Bannon that that issue has been decided. But it's my understanding that this structure could have been approved whether it was attached or not. So therefore, Mr. Smith's determination that it is attached is um, superflu superfluous, if you will. It meets all other space and bulk requirements of the zoning ordinance, at least that's my understanding, whether it's atta an attached structure or not. So I think that the issue of whether it's attached or not it is for this board to decide because it was not critical uh, to the issuance of the building permit. Um, so I, I, I think your scope of review is limited to what was approved and what was built. Did it go beyond what, what that which was actually constructed? Did it go beyond what was contemplated by the building permit? Um, and with regard to whether it's attached or not, uh, that's going to be for the board to determine uh, on the next matter that's before you, which is the conditional use application. Are there any questions? Would, is there a problem of consistency or inconsistency here if we, if we leave that as it be and then we approach the second matter um, and try to treat that as a detached building? where on the one hand we've accepted it as an attached building. No, that's, that's my point. I think that that issue is open for, for this board to decide as to whether it's attached or detached. Well, Mr. Smith's de description as an attached building is not governing Correct. on us as far as a legal definition. That's my opinion. Because, because it wasn't um, critical to the issuance of the, of the permit. If uh, if this building could not be constructed unless the determination had been made that it was an attached structure, uh, then my opinion would be different. But it's my understanding that this structure would meet the space and bulk requirements. There's no requirement that it be an attached structure in order for the permit to issue. So that's why I don't place legal significance on Mr. Smith's uh, determination, and that, that I think that's a matter for the board to determine. Well, if, if under the Salisbury versus Town of Bar Harbor case, we're supposed to look at whether um, Ms. Evans and Mr. Sellers meaningfully exceeded the authority contained in the permit or otherwise violated conditions of the permit, what are the conditions of this permit that we're supposed to look at? The only thing it says is construct a 28 by 36 foot attached structure. <coughs> is attached structure a condition of the permit? I, I don't read it that way, no. That's, so, that's my opinion, no. So what are the conditions that we're to look at to see whether they've exceeded those or violated them? Well, I, I don't see that there were conditions on this except not to be used as a business office, I think is a condition uh, on here. Um, other things that you would look at is, uh, you know, the, the uh, what's the side setback on this? 30 feet. 30 feet. So they're supposed to be more than 30 feet away from the side setback, uh, the sideline. And if they built 15 feet away, they exceeded their permit. I mean, it doesn't specifically state here uh, on this permit that it has exactly where it has to be on the face of the earth, but that's one of the requirements for obtaining a building permit. So if, if they put it in the wrong place, they built it too high, uh, you know, any of those types of violations that exceeded what was permitted would uh, allow this board to invalidate the certificate of occupancy and require the applicant uh, uh, to make the changes to bring it into compliance with the issuance of the building permit. And presumably the burden is on Dr. Wenberg and Ms. Carney to Correct. show us that there has been um, a, meaning, a, they a meaningful yes. violation of the conditions of Correct. the permit. Right, as the, as, the, as the moving party, that would be correct. Other questions from the board for Mr. Hill about where we stand right now? I have one question. It, 
just for clarity, um, is it your assertion from your earlier comments that as a board we should be considering not so much the building's use at a time of the application for the permit, but did they say, stay significantly within the submitted plans? Correct, be because all that was all that was permitted is this structure, and so you're for the purposes of this first matter on the agenda, the appeal of the issuance of the certificate of occupancy. Um, it's my opinion you're looking at the structure itself, and did they meaningfully exceed what approval they received for the structure. Thanks. And then the, the second issue, the second matter tonight is on the conditional use permit and that's when you get, get into the other issues. A key element here is that the granting of the permit and the granting of the certificate of occupancy, neither one of those depended at all really whether it was attached or detached. Correct. That's my opinion of it, yes. And you don't see that we are foreclosed from addressing any issues in the next matter by our decision on the first one? Correct. If you uphold the issuance of the certificate of occupancy, I don't, it's my opinion that you are not foreclosing uh, as to whether this, uh, the, the issue, you're not foreclosing the issue as to whether this is attached or detached, because that was not um, a critical element in the issuance of the building permit. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hill. Um, why don't we give um, Mr. Brogan an opportunity to reply first, and then Mr. Bannon give you an opportunity. Mr. Brogan, if, if there is any response you'd like to make uh, right, to Mr. Hill. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Bannon. Uh, Mike is a person whose opinion I respect a great deal. In this circumstance, I could not disagree more, and I believe that if the board thinks about this carefully, you will see our point of view. You cannot say, as Michael Hill has said, that this building permit doesn't say anything about whether it's an attached structure or not. It does. It says that what they were authorized to build was an attached structure. How did Mr. Smith know to put that on the building permit approval? He had to review plans and descriptions of this project given to him by the applicants. He had to determine that what he was looking at satisfied the definition of an attached structure in order to issue this building permit. <coughs> so this is an adjudication of this issue. More importantly, I think for the purposes of this appeal perhaps, Mr. Hill stated that that was not a critical term of the building permit. My clients could not disagree more. They had known going into this project that what they wanted to wind up with was an addition that would house on the first floor their personal library and on the second floor a home business for Leslie Evans. This was a huge investment for them to go forward with and they had to make sure that the way they were designing this building would be an attached structure because they knew if it wasn't, they couldn't get conditional use approval for the home business. My clients carefully went over this with Mr. Smith. Uh, my clients and Mr. Smith agreed that what they were proposing to do with the catwalk, which is what I will call it, connecting the buildings, did cause this to be an attached structure, a structure attached to a residence. In reliance upon that determination, my clients went forward and spent $150,000 building this building. If that doesn't make that determination critical, I don't know what does. Now, Mr. Brogan earlier said that somehow I had turned the law of Maine on its head. 
Well, I tried to once, uh, and I failed. And I wound up with the law just as I have quoted it to you. I tried to argue what Mr. Brogan is saying. I challenged the permit, I think, 60 days after it had been issued in the town of Kenny Bunkport, uh, because it had been issued in a resource protection zone. Everybody conceded that the building permit should never have been issued. The Zoning Board of Appeals agreed. The Superior Court agreed. What the Maine Law Court said was, we have to make a choice with these appeal deadlines. We have a certain interest in making sure that, that decisions are made correctly, and that's why we give people 30 days in which to bring appeals. On the other hand, there is just as, um, as important an interest in what the law court called repose. That is to say, the right of a property owner to rely on a decision after the appeal period has gone by. And what the law court decided against my argument in that case of Wright versus Kenny Bunk Court was that it's more important to be able to ensure repose and reliance upon code enforcement officer decisions than to make sure that they are right. And that if the, the appellate deadline goes by and a permit is not challenged, that is the end of the challenge to anything that was decided with regard to that permit. I am very certain of what the, the law court said in that case is because, as I say, I lost. Uh, there was a very minor point that I'd like to address. There's been an argument about the fact that this building permit says not to be used as a business office. The reason that's in there is because we knew, Mr. Smith knew, Mr. Smith wanted to make clear that the issuance of this building permit by itself would not allow the construction or the, the creation of a home business in this addition. You'd have to come back for conditional use approval. We agree that that's true. Why would we challenge that? That's the reason that language is in there. So once again, what you're looking at is my client's investment of $150,000. After having gone through all the procedures set forth by this town in an effort to find out whether what they were doing was correct before they did it. They did all those things, they got all the assurances they, they could possibly get, and now, more than 30 days later, uh, the appellants are asking this board to say, no, let's upset that expectation, never mind that $150,000, let's not let them have the business here. And, the main, and I submit that that is what Maine law says, and to say otherwise would be setting it on its head. Well, why don't you stay up there so we can Sure. Get some clarification on this. Um, so, I, I think I hear you saying that you agree, at least as to what the Salisbury case says. That, yes. That um, we're limited to looking at whether um, your clients meaningfully exceeded the authority contained in the permit. That much is true. Um, and are you taking the position then that the language of the permit that says that um, permission is granted to construct a 28 by 36 attached structure that attached is a condition of the permit, that we find that that they have not meaningfully exceeded the conditions of the permit, that we have made a determination for all time that it is in fact an attached structure. That is correct, and I, I want to make something a little clearer than that though. In determining whether or not uh, there's been a meaningful exceedance of the building permit, you are not asked to reconsider whether this is an attached structure or not. Uh, Mike Hill and I would agree on that point, um, that in deciding whether the building as built uh, is, exceeds the building permit has nothing to do with whether you think it was an attached structure or not. You simply compare the building permit to what was built. Are they the same? Are they meaningfully the same? Nobody said they aren't. That should be the end of this issue. What I'm saying, in a sense, anticipating the next uh, uh, appeal that will be before you is that the issue of whether this is an attached structure or not 
is not open to question in any respect because of the reliance interest that my clients have, uh, having invested $150,000 in this, uh, on this project, uh, going through all the proper permitting procedures, letting the appeal period go by without any appeal. Uh, the law of Maine says that enough is enough after 30 days, and at that point, uh, landowners should be allowed to rely on what they've gotten. So you don't read the language of the permit that refers to an attached structure as a condition? No, I regard that as a determination that what they told Mr. Smith they were going to build was an attached structure. So if they said to Mr. Smith, we are going to build a house and we are going to build an addition to our house and we are going to connect those two uh, parts with a catwalk, and if Mr. Smith looks at those facts and says, that is an attached structure, that is a decision. That is his, that's his interpretation of the zoning ordinance. That's what he's supposed to do. He's the front line guy on making those kinds of determinations. Nobody appealed that decision. <clears throat> and that's what I'm trying to make clear here tonight. Nobody ever said that was wrong in the time period that they were allowed to say that it was wrong. So it's not a condition, it's a fact. And so the question only is, did, if my client said we are going to build an addition for the catwalk that, that joins onto our house, did they in fact build an addition for the catwalks that joined onto their house? If they did, this administrative appeal is over. Thank you for clarifying that. I'd like to ask, a, I'm a little confused on something, and maybe I shouldn't be, but you've, in your first remarks just now, you, you mentioned that this was built all along with the intention that it be the final place for, the, for your client's business, but I thought that someone said in part of the building uh, permit application that something about it's not to be a business, um, and not to be used as a business office. And let me explain that again. <coughs> And Mr. Smith can uh, tell me if I'm wrong, um, but I don't think he will. Mr. Smith was aware that there was already a home business in this house. All right, this board approved it in 2001. Most of the members of the board who are here tonight were on that approval. <coughs> Ms. Evans was planning to build an addition, and she wanted to move that uh, that business into. Uh, the upper part of this, uh, this addition. That is what she proposed. That's, that's what she told Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith said to her correctly, the fact that I'm giving you this building permit does not mean by itself that you can go ahead and have a business here. You're going to have to come back to the Zoning Board of Appeals and get a conditional use permit if that's what you want to do. That wasn't a prohibition on, on there ever being a home business at this site. Um, in fact, if, and this is up to, to Bruce and my clients to, uh, to clarify, at one point, as I understand it, there was some thought that my clients didn't even have to come back to amend their, uh, their conditional use application simply to move it from one place to another. When that was clarified that under Mr. Smith's interpretation of the ordinance, they would have to come back, that is why the permit says this particular permit doesn't let you have a home business. If you want one, and what it says parenthetically is, if you want one, you have to come back to this board for conditional use approval. And uh, if I've said anything wrong, uh, Bruce, please let me know. Uh, let me ask you one final question, if sure. I may, please. Um, your, your position is that, that Mr. Smith's description of this as an attached building is therefore binding on the zoning board in terms of our future consideration of a subsequent matter. Um, do you have any case law to support that assertion? To support the assertion that... Uh, that a statement by the building, a description by the building inspector or code enforcement officer 
of a sure building do. attached or detached is subsequently binding on a zoning board of appeals? If it's not appealed, yes, that's right, versus town of Kennebunkport. That's one of my cases, that the one I lost. Uh, Salisbury case uh, reaffirms right on that point. Um, there's uh, another case um, that was cited in uh, in Salisbury, I, I can't remember, it was in some town in, in central uh, Maine, but um, there have been two cases so far that say that, here, this, I hope you will find this interesting. I can't remember the name of the case, I can go look it up. What happened in the case after Wright was that a code enforcement officer uh, had granted a building permit for a particular use. Then that code enforcement officer retired or left, and a new one came on and decided that that building permit had been issued in error. This is the code enforcement officer saying it, the new one. And the code enforcement officer revoked the permit. The Maine Supreme Court said, not even the code enforcement officer can do that if 30 days have gone by. Once the 30 days have gone by, that building permit is valid, period. And that's but Charlton versus, uh, I think, town of Oxford. Perhaps I, I'm, I wasn't clear enough with you. I wasn't right. asking whether the building permit's valid. I, I think we're okay. accepting that. At least I accept that. I'm asking you whether the fact that the code enforcement officer in granting the building permit and the certificate of occupancy, the fact that he used the word attached as part of a description becomes a legally binding matter for subsequent consideration by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Yes, that is my assertion. And now I'm asking you whether there is any case law that would support that assertion. Yes, and that would include, amongst other things, Wright versus Town of Kenny Bunkport, and uh, Charlton versus Town of Oxford, and Salisbury itself. Uh, I, I would strongly recommend that the board read Wright for itself. Uh, I lost it fair and square, but that's what it says. And after 30 days, it's just too late for anybody to complain about, whether it's a zoning board of appeals or a butter or even the code enforcement officer. It's just uh, I'm not sure we're talking, we're not talking about the building permit. We're talking about right. whether, whether that one word attached right. as a descriptive adjective right. carries forward with heavy legal significance to a right. subsequent matter. What That's matter? all I'm asking about. Okay, I'm sorry. If, if Mr. Smith had just thrown that in uh, for no particular reason, uh, if my clients had never discussed it with him, for example, uh, if nobody cared, maybe that wouldn't matter. But in this particular case, what my clients did was to come to Mr. Smith and ask him, is what we are going to do here by connecting these buildings with a catwalk going to make that an attached structure as opposed to an accessory use? That's what makes the difference, because that was a decision that Mr. Smith made. It wasn't just uh, something that went by the wayside. $150,000 turned on the answer to that question. And that's what makes the difference. This is not just some nuance. This is the crux of that building permit. But you know that Mr. Smith cannot grant a conditional use permit. You're, ba you're basically saying that you are asking Mr. Smith to approve the use of this for a business, and he doesn't have that authority. Not at all. Not at all, sir, and I understand what you're saying. Mr. Smith cannot approve this as a conditional use. You would have to go through all the conditional use criteria, and you would have to decide whether it meets those criteria. That part of the decision is still totally within your jurisdiction. If, for some reason, you thought this was a horrible business and that it, it violated all the conditional use criteria, you could turn it down. But you can't turn it down based on the assertion that it's not an attached structure, because that has been determined by the code enforcement officer conclusively. But that's the only issue that is foreclosed. We still have to meet the other criteria for conditional use. I'm not certain I agree with that assessment along the same lines as Mr. Keneally's. Um, when in the issuance of his permit, the attachment, the term attachment, is weighed as he's making his determination, but I'm not sure it transcends into the decision that we're being asked to make on the conditional use permit. Well, I'm telling you that it does, 
And because of the principle that I'm talking about, which is called administrative race judicata, it applies to everybody. And that's, that's the point I'm trying to make about that, that case in Oxford. It doesn't mean that just uh, the appellant is foreclosed from thinking about it again. It doesn't mean that just the code enforcement officer can't think about it again. It means that nobody can think about it again. Not even a court can think about it again. I'm dead serious. That is the way the law works. If the, if the 30 days goes by, no one on earth can challenge that determination. But am I correct that you're talking here about whether one can challenge the granting of a building permit? Correct. Not the legal significance of one word, an adjective that was part of the granting. And that's where we disagree, because it was not simply an adjective. It was a characterization of this structure using the zoning ordinance and determining that what my clients presented to Mr. Smith was an attached structure as opposed to an accessory use. It's no accident. They went and they got an accessory. Let's be very clear about this. The first building permit they got was for an accessory structure. All right? My clients went to the trouble of coming back to Mr. Smith and saying, no, it isn't. It's an attached structure. Look at this. This is what we're planning to do. He changed one building permit to another. It's not just an incidental term. It was critical that that term change from accessory use to attached structure, or else my clients could never complete their goal. That is not simply a, a throwaway item. I understand what you're saying, but I, I also am wondering whether you're wishing and maybe assuming that Mr. Smith subsumes some authority from the Zoning Board of Appeals for the benefit of your client's application here. I don't think that he does, and I'm not saying that. Um, but what I'm trying to, to distinguish is the authority of the board and Mr. Smith. This board has to decide whether Ms. Evans' business, as proposed, meets the conditional use criteria, such as does it have any signs, is there more than one employee, what's the effect on traffic, and so forth. Those are the only criteria that you have to work with under the conditional use criteria. What the building is, what kind of a structure it is, is a decision for the code enforcement officer to make. And that is what happened in this case. It's not that you don't have jurisdiction. It's a question of what you have jurisdiction to decide. Additional questions? Well, I would say one thing once again. As you were going through the process of the building permit, if so much of your future anticipation of that use of that building hinged on being attached or detached, that perhaps it would have behooved you to, to go a little bit further in your description of attached. And I'd also like to hear from Mr. Smith as to his recollections, recollection of the discussions, and did they identify you their future anticipated use? <coughs> uh, simply, when the permit was applied for, it was applied for, for uh, additional living space for the single family dwelling. The issue of the business wasn't necessarily an issue. Uh, when it was brought to my attention that, 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 that I should look at that in regards to future expansion as a home business in that, in that space, which they had planned to do, that's when I reviewed it in that context. Uh, and I did change it to attach, not because necessarily because the building permit hinged on it, but because after review of the ordinance, an accessory building is a detached building. I wanted to make it clear that from that point on, at least from my interpretation of the ordinance, that it, that it was an attached building for the purposes of, of um, at least easing them their fear that maybe it wasn't going to be uh, treated as such in the future, although there was no guarantees made that, that, that this board would, have, would approve or, or, or disapprove uh, the application. But, but the reason for that wording change is simply because the, uh, the applicants did come forward and, and, and wanted to make it clear that, that what they're asking for is an attached building, and I reviewed it for that purpose. Or I did make a change to my interpretation was then and it still is now that, that it's not an accessory structure because it's 
it's not detached. And so I changed the record or I changed the building permit to reflect that situation. Yes, Mr. Hill. I would take the same position uh, tonight if that original building permit had not been changed and it said for an accessory structure. I would take the position that Mr. Smith's determination on that initial building permit does not take away from this board's jurisdictional uh, determination or determination in the uh, context of the conditional use application uh, that it that it would be an accessory structure you would still be able to make that determination um, if the building permit had been issued and as part of the building permit it said you know an attached structure which shall not produce any odors fumes dust and, and so forth um, that determination is one of the uh, definitions of a home business. I don't think that Mr. Smith's determination on a building permit that it didn't uh, produce odors, fumes, etc., would be binding upon this board. That isn't within Mr. Smith's um, purview in issuing that building permit. It's for this board to decide whether all the conditions of 1955 conditional use application are met. It's up to this board to determine whether all the conditions as set forth in the definition of home business are met. And again, I would not attach, uh, I wouldn't place legal significance on Mr. Smith's use of the word attached structure in the building permit any more than I would have if he had left it alone and said accessory structure in the original building permit because it, it's going to be within your determination to determine whether it's attached or detached accessory structure or not. I, I'm asked, I asked um, Mrs. Mr. Evans' Mr. attorney whether yes, or not sir. there was case law putting the assertion that the, the use of a particular word by the code enforcement office had binding authority on subsequent actions by the zoning board and he, he told me there was, so there was case law that Confirm that. So you're basically saying you do not believe there is case law, or well, uh, there's certainly case law, and I believe it's a town of that. I'm I'm not I'm worse than uh, than you are, John, with cases of uh, case names. But I think it was a town of Poland case where um, the code enforcement officer, a, a different one, came along. It was Giuliano versus town of Poland. Yeah. Um, so you don't get a second bite at the apple on a building permit. Well, I understood that. But if there are words, it's my opinion, uh, that if there are words used in a building permit which are not essential for the issuance of the building permit. That was then, all I asked. Huh? That was all I asked. Yeah. yeah. I don't know of any cases that that would are as specific as what's before you tonight as to whether there's legal significance to using the word attached structure that would take away uh, from this board's review on a conditional use application. And, and nobody's arguing that they're getting a second bite at the apple on the, on the uh, issuance of the building permit, so. Mr. Brogan, if you want an opportunity, and I'm not going <laughs> to compel you to come up and say anything, but I feel like we should give you the last opportunity to say something on this. It's, it's a very simple, actually, my response, and it, it doesn't come from my legal uh, training, but it comes from my thought of what should be a fair and just process. If uh, a person who is presented with this building permit and it, then it is sent out to the neighborhood a uh, request for a hearing on, on this building permit, reads a building permit, and says it's not to be used as a business office, and then we are told that, in fact, the whole discussion was that it was supposed to be built, used as a business office. I don't know how anybody could appeal from that issue without even knowing what it is. There are neighbors here who are, uh, you know, neighbors to this whole process and were presented with a, uh, an agenda for a board meeting for the approval of this permit and looking at it, how do they go to the ZBA and say, 
well, gee, we were told it was not to be used as a business office, and now, in fact, what the whole discussion was, it was going to be used as a business office, but the building permit didn't mean anything. Uh, I understand what Mr. Hill is saying about <coughs> whether or not the appeal is appropriate to the building permit and accept it, uh, and would accept the, uh, the ZBA's uh, decision that, in fact, the building permit is correct and that, but that does not foreclose the issue of whether or not uh, a conditional use can be had in this building and whether or not this is a, uh, a separate structure or a, uh, an attached structure. Do you disagree with anything that Mr. Hill has said so far this evening? I have not disagreed with anything Mr. Hill has said so far this evening. Are, 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 you, are you prepared so to... So far. <laughs> so far. I'm not binding you to everything that he might say before the evening's over. You don't over. know what he's going to pop up and say next, <laughs> so I want to just you know, make sure so far. Um, are you prepared to present uh, the board with any evidence that um, Ms. Evans has meaningfully exceeded the authority contained in the permit or otherwise violated conditions of the permit? The only thing I can say is she meaningfully exceeded is that she's operating a business within the uh, within the building. That's that evidence has already been presented and has not been rebutted. Okay. Thank you. Is there anything else, um, Mr. <clears throat> Brogan, that you want to present on behalf of your clients and their administrative appeal? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. I have one quick question. At the time of the certificate of occupancy was issued, how was the second floor being utilized? Was it being utilized as a business or was it as living space? Bruce? The certificate of occupancy was issued as living space, additional living space. And the it was not, there was no office at the time of occupancy. <clears throat> Thank you. Or I wouldn't have issued a stick. Great. <clears throat> Is there anyone else here tonight who is here to speak on behalf of the administrative appeal of Dr. Winberg and Ms. Carney? With the understanding that right now that's the only matter we're hearing. We're not at this time addressing uh, the request of Ms. Evans uh, for a conditional use permit. Yes, ma'am. If you would step up to the microphone, please, and tell us your name and address. My name is Marion Holzhauser. I reside in 137 Two Lights Road, and the property abuts that of the property in question. And uh, would you spell your last name for us, please? H-O-L-S-H-O-U-S-E-R. Thank you. Um, listening to the um, process, and this is what has raised some questions in my mind. The um, building permit and permit of occupancy, as far as I know, uh, we were never notified that any such procedure or operation was taking place, so there would never have been an opportunity to appeal or even know that we had 30 days in which to do so, but that's water over the dam. <clears throat> the other problem I have is with the definition of um, accessory or attached, and whether, you know, how significant is that? Well, if um, you could hold that thought until we get to the next. Right, I won't ask you to. The, the, the next part of the hearing this evening, we'll take and, that up. Yes. and. <laughs> It's process that I guess I question in terms of how those of us who are interested are informed enough so that we could take the measures necessary at the proper time. And so I uh, will be interested to see how this plays out. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hill? I just wanted to respond to the uh notice issue that I'm going to butcher your last name, but Mrs. Holzhauser uh, mentioned. Um, no notice is required when, when a building permit is issued, and that, that has been upheld uh, by, the, by the courts. And I, I know that may seem un, unfair, but a lot of building permits get issued uh, in a year, 
and not everyone is, uh, there's not a uh, requirement that notice be sent out. So it, there is a burden upon property owners to be aware of what's going on in their neighborhood and, and to uh, check periodically if they wish to see if building permits are, are issued. I, I just didn't want it to be left that people might think that the town didn't do something, uh, provide notice that they were supposed to. There is no notice requirement on the issuance of a, a building permit. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, yes, sir, did you want to speak um, in favor of the administrative appeal? I would like to. You may. If you, would, if you would come up to the microphone, please, and tell us your name and address, please. Well, my name is Christy Harding. I live at 10 Angel Point Road, where I've resided for 27 years. I've had two conversations with Mr. Smith in early to mid-construction, and they were all relevant to the use of the structure. The first time I was shown the application, I guess the first application, with the rather bold sentence concerning the use of the building and the, or, the, or the unuse of the building, not to be used for business. Second time, I was shown the same thing. Mr. Smith waffled with me a bit about it, and we discussed whether this would be a growth business and what would happen if we had many cars there with little children next door. Uh, more esoteric issues concerning the use of this building, whether it was attached or not, seemed to be sort of irrelevant to me because the attachment was nothing more than a, a way for a pedestrian walkway to get to it. It didn't have heat, didn't have light, didn't have the closure. Those are the only things that I'd like to bring before the board. Thank you, sir. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor of the administrative appeal? Is there anyone who is here to speak in opposition to the administrative appeal um, other than uh, Mr. Bannon's clients? Okay, well, that will close the public discussion uh, portion of the hearing, and I will open it to uh, board discussion. Um, however, I, I think I would like to ask Mr. Hill to come back up to the podium, because I think there will be some questions of him through this, and I want to ask one clarifying question to help direct us in where we go at this point. Based on what I've heard, I think that the motion that we need to consider or present would be um, for someone to present a motion as to whether Ms. Evans and Ms. Sellers have meaningfully exceeded the authority contained in their building permit or otherwise violated the conditions of the permit. Is there anything else for us to present for motion on this administrative appeal? Um, you may want to include in the motion whether you feel that uh, the use of the word attached uh, structure in the uh, building permit and certificate of occupancy um, uh, is, is binding upon this board. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that you need to because I think you can address that issue in, in, in terms of the next item, the conditional use application. Um, if you'd like us to vote that up or down affirmatively, you know, one way or the other. Well, yeah, my, my sense of why the appeal was taken in the first place was for um, there not to be legal significance placed upon the use of the word attached structure in the permit and certificate of occupancy. Um, so I, I think it would be appropriate for the board to include, to, to address that issue in terms of the administrative appeal. And it could be as simple as leaving open the issue as, as you know, leaving that issue uh, to be determined in the conditional use um, hearing. 
Okay. I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> well, I think it is. Um, discussion from the board? <clears throat> Dr. Chapman. Uh, Mr. Smith, is it, it is my understanding that an accessory building or an accessory structure existing can be converted from being, becoming not an accessory structure or an attached integral part of the primary structure dwelling by the addition of a connecting structure between the two, is that correct? In oh. other words, an accessory building cannot fall into that, meet that definition if a structure is built between the two, is that correct? That's correct. I'm familiar with a case that I believe uh, we have, as an example, we have uh, come before our board where there was a primary dwelling. A garage was built sometime after that and we approved a connection between the two or breezeway with a living environment between the two. That rendered the garage not an accessory structure. Is that going back to the issuance of the permit for this structure. Uh, the point whether the word attached or detached becomes somewhat irrelevant if there is a subsequent attachment made between the two. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. Uh, it's also my understanding that the attachment between the two existing structures or structures in question uh, in this photograph requires a permit to be constructed. Is that correct? That's correct. And since this requires a permit to connect the existing dwelling to the additional dwelling, and that structure is attached to both items, does that, in your mind, render this as an attached structure? Yes, because it's continuous of, of, of what's existing. It's continual. With, with that in mind, since a accessory structure can be converted into a non-accessory structure by an attachment, or by building a permittable structure structure between the two that requires a permit and that somewhat leads the definition of whether the word attached is included in the original uh, permit is irrelevant uh, do you understand my point mr hill i'm not sure that i do i i i, I think you're agreeing with me that the that the word attached used in the building permit um, was not essential or critical to, to the issuance of the building permit for the barn-like structure. If the structure that was built started out as an accessory structure, it could be changed into an integral part of the house by connecting the two. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that uh, supports your discussion that that word attached is irrelevant to that. Uh, so whether it was presented to you as one way or the other is insignificant to some degree as to uh, the original permit that was issued is my point. The permit could have been issued either way. I'm sorry? The permit could and be issued either way. The structure that was built was completely within the ordinance as it was built, whether it was attached or not, correct? That's correct.
the connection between the two, which required a permit, was that presented to you at, in the original plan for the addition? It was on the original plans, yes. Was it relevant to you what type of connection there was? No. Was it relevant as to how the connection was built, as to whether I considered it attached or not, or was it relevant whether I considered the two attached for the issuance of a building permit, which, which you were asking? It, it was not a concern as to whether it was covered or enclosed? In no, way. no. Just had it, had it, it been a dry paved uh, field stone on the ground, then I wouldn't have considered it attachment um, because that doesn't require a building permit. And since the interconnecting structure was attached to both structures, then you assumed at that point that it was attached? That's correct. Where a walkway would not have required a permit, this attachment did require a permit. And that a walkway permit in the sense that, it's, that, it, that it was self-supporting on the, on the ground and not dependent upon the, the the, the size of the two structures would would uh, would render it not being a structure which would not need a permit, which would mean that the two would not be attached. My point in bringing that up uh, is that whether the building was accessory structure from the onset or not. It was, it was uh, conceived and completed within the permit that, to which it was applied. The structure was connected under your understanding by the original plan submitted to be a, an attached structure, and it seems to satisfy that since it is uh, the attachment between the two does require a permit. Yes. Other comments from the board? I think what I'd like to do is take this up in, Mr. Hill doesn't give me the thumbs down on this, be to take this up in two separate motions. Um, one, um, a motion, um, if somebody would be willing to make a motion substantially as follows, um, and that is that the uh, word attached in permit number 020639 as issued by the code enforcement officer uh, was descriptive only and not a binding determination that the structure was attached or detached for purposes of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance. Um, and Mr. The, Chairman, I think that the, the issue before us is not really with the building permit, but within, with the certificate of occupancy. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, does the certificate of occupancy um, <coughs> also use that same language so about attached? The, the certificate of occupancy refers to a structure addition additional living space to the single family dwelling. It's structure addition. I call it a structure addition. This is certified that the structure addition at 133 Two Lights Road has been found and inspected and may now be occupied as additional living space to the single family dwelling. The, uh, certific the certificate of occupancy uh, doesn't use the word um, attached or detached. It refers to addition. Right. And structure addition is not a uh, defined term in the ordinance connoting attached or detached. Right. 
it wasn't relative, re relevant to, to the issuance as additional living space for the single family dwelling. Okay, then, then I, I don't have any suggestions to your requested motion then. No, structure addition is not a defined term. Addition, addition is not a defined term under the ordinance. So I think that the motion that you suggested is fine. So anyway, where I was going was, it would be two part. One, a vote as to whether or not the use of the word attached was determinative or not, or whether it was merely descriptive. And then second, um, a motion as to whether um, Ms. Evans and Mr. Sellers in the construction of their addition meaningfully exceeded the authority contained in the permit or otherwise violated conditions of the permit. And that would be the way I would propose that we approach this. Two separate votes. Both issues will be laid out for purposes of any appeal uh, to the extent there is one. Could you repeat the second motion, please? Well, the, the second motion uh, comes verbatim from the uh, Salisbury versus Town of Bar Harbor case that has been discussed by everyone. Um, and what that case says um, is, I'll just read a, a couple of sentences of it. It says, if the permittee has complied with the terms of a valid permit, and a butter may not challenge the issuance of the certificate of occupancy based on a defect in the permit. If, however, the permittee has meaningfully exceeded the authority contained in the permit or otherwise violated conditions of the permit, the issuance of the certificate of occupancy may be challenged. In other words, if the administrative appeal that we have from Dr. Wenberg and Ms. Carney is intended to be a challenge to the certificate of occupancy, what the Salisbury versus Town of Bar Harbor case says is that their challenge is limited to whether or not uh, the permittee has meaningfully exceeded the authority contained in the permit or otherwise violated conditions of the permit. And beyond that, we cannot look any deeper. Am I correct the way yes. I'm explaining that? Yes. So, if that seems to be a reasonable way to approach this, um, could I have a motion uh, from someone? Um, uh, a motion that the uh, use of the word, quote, attached, end quote, in permit number 020639, issued by the code enforcement officer on July 1, 2002 for the property at map U41 lot 5 on one, at 133 Two Lights Road was descriptive only and not a binding determination that the structure was attached or detached for purposes of the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance. I make a motion verbatim to as what you have just done. Okay, the motion, uh, Mr. LaPlante, do we have a second? Second. Um, second. And do we have discussion on the motion? <coughs> Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of the motion? Opposed? The motion is approved by a vote of seven in favor, uh, zero opposed. Um, the next motion, if we could have one, would be um, a motion that 
Ms. Evans and Mr. Sellers as the recipients. of Certificate of Occupancy Number 030034. For map U41 lot 5, 133 Two Lights Road, issued by the Code Enforcement Officer on October 22, 2002, has meaningfully exceeded the authority Wait, let me rephrase that. I shouldn't have been referring to the certificate of occupancy. I should have been referring to the building permit. So um, a motion that uh, Ms. Evans and Mr. Sellers as the recipient of building permit number 020639 for map U41 lot 5, 133 Two Lights Road, issued by the Code Enforcement Officer on July 1, 2002, meaningfully exceeded the authority contained in the permit or otherwise violated conditions of the permit. Anyone willing to make that motion? Also move. Uh, Mr. Mendelson? Could you, could you restate the motion, please? I'm not sure what the motion actually is. Um, the motion, in essence, is um, for a finding that Ms. Sellers and Ms. Evans exceeded, meaningfully exceeded, the authority of their building permit. You're stating the motion in the affirmative. I am stating the motion in the affirmative. Okay, good. And we have a motion. We have a motion uh, from Mr. Mendelson, and we need a second. Seconded. A second, Mr. Alpine. A discussion on the motion. Hearing none. All those in favor of the motion. All those opposed? The motion is defeated by a vote of zero in favor, seven opposed. And that concludes the administrative appeal of Dr. Winberg and Ms. Carney. So the determination is that they did not exceed the authority issued under the building permit. Yes. Right. Um, that is correct. Yes. Although we didn't vote on it in the negative. We voted it down in the affirmative. Yes. The next item on our agenda should be a familiar one to the people who are here at this point, and that is to hear the application of Leslie Evans and Ronnie Sellers, 133 Two Lights Road, tax map U41 lot 5, for a conditional use permit to relocate an existing home business. Now, I suggest that before we get started with this, that since we've been going now for an hour and 40 minutes, that we take a 10-minute break, give everybody a chance to do whatever they want to do for 10 minutes, um, and we will reconvene at uh, 10 minutes till 9. We are back in session and back on the air. And we are picking up with the second item of new business, and that is to hear the application of Leslie Evans and Ronnie Sellers, 133 Two Lights Road, tax map U41, lot 5, for a conditional use permit to relocate an existing home business. <clears throat> and for the benefit of the members of the board, 
Um, for purposes of the ordinance, we are under, on page 57 of the ordinance, is section 19-6-1 that deals with residents, a residence A district. And in paragraph C, it defines conditional uses in an RA zone, in an RA district. And one of the conditional uses under paragraph C3 is a home business as an accessory use. And conditional use permits are defined um, under section 19-5-5, which is on page 53, 54, and 55 of the ordinance. So those are, those are the relevant sections that we're going to be looking at along with the definitions at the beginning of the ordinance. Um, and if there are other sections I hope somebody will tell us along the way. And uh, Mr. Bannon, would you like to make the presentation on behalf of your clients? Yes, and it, it seems to me that the first thing we need to do before we get too deep into the conditional use permit, or maybe before we get to the conditional use permit at all, is to look at the underlying issue of whether or not this structure is attached or not. Very good, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I had planned to begin uh, for the benefit of the neighbors simply to indicate the nature of this con of the home business that uh, Ms. Evans was is proposing because there seems to be some misconception about the nature of it and also how this process came about, because there seems to be some suggestion that there is something sinister or something happened behind the scenes. And I think it's important uh, for everyone to know that that didn't happen and how this matter is before you today. Um, so if I could just briefly touch on those matters, I would appreciate it. it that's fine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'll leave it to uh, CEO Smith to contradict me if I say anything wrong. Uh, what I'm saying is based on uh, what my clients have told me, uh, but their recollections seem to be uh, very accurate. Now, we know that the certificate of occupancy was issued on October 22nd. And at that point, uh, as Mr. Smith says, uh, Ms. Evans was not at that point operating a business in the top floor of the addition. However, it was her intention to do so immediately, and Ms. Evans spoke with Mr. Smith about what did she need to do to start up that business, or to move the business, I should say, into the new addition. Because, as I hope the neighbors understand, and as I think most of the members of this board know, in 2001, this board unanimously approved a home business in Ms. Evans's home in the main house uh, for approximately 224 square foot area. So that there was an existing home business there that was perfectly legal. Ms. Evans, as I say, asked Mr. Smith, what did she need to do to move her business from the main house to the addition? And at first, they thought that it would be sufficient if Ms. Evans wrote Mr. Smith a letter to that effect confirming that she had moved the uh, business. And she did that. I don't have a copy, for some reason, of, of Ms. Evans' letter, although I have a copy of Mr. Smith's letter back to her, uh, dated November 18th of 2002. And he confirms that, dear Ms. Evans, this is in response to your letter of 103102, in which you stated, I have moved the location of my home business to a larger room in the extension of our house. So this was Ms. Evans' effort to let Mr. Smith know officially that she wanted to move the business, that she had moved the business, uh, to the top floor of the addition. Mr. Smith writes back that on his reading of the ordinance at this point, 
uh, if you expand the area of conditional use, you have to come back before the Zoning Board of Appeals and get a new approval. And so that's what uh, Mr. Smith wrote to Ms. Evans on November 18th of 2002. Um, he said, clearly it is in your best interest to seek a new conditional use approval immediately. I will forego enforcement action until after you've had the opportunity to seek approval from the Zoning Board. So that there was nothing illegal or evasive going out and going on in the top floor of that addition. It's something that Mr. Smith was aware about, something that he was handling appropriately, and something that was going to happen and be resolved in due course, which is what we're here to do tonight, uh, which is to seek conditional use approval for the expansion and the movement of this business. Now, for the benefit of the neighbors, um, this is the, the letter that Ms. Evans wrote to the board describing her use, and uh, I'll just go through this briefly. Uh, to the Zoning Board of Cape Elizabeth, this is Ms. Evans speaking. On April 24, 2001, the Zoning Board reviewed and approved my application for a conditional use permit for a graphics office slash studio home business. The permit allows me to operate my business in a room of our house that is about 224 square feet in area. I would like to expand the area of my business to allow me to have more space for flat files within which I store artwork, lateral files, and bookshelves. The ordinances say that I need to go back before the board in order to do so. And uh, this is Ms. Evans writing on January 14th of this year. I've included a floor plan of the proposed office, which is located in the second floor of an expansion of our single family dwelling that we built last summer. The nature of my business has not changed whatsoever. I sit at a computer and design advertisements, catalogs, and labels. I still have one graphics assistant who does essentially the same thing that I do. Occasionally, I meet with a client in my studio, but for the most part, my client meetings occur at their offices. It is and shall remain a very low impact business. We have ample room for parking, as was explained in our previous application, although my business really doesn't involve many visitors, uh, period. And uh, in her application to the board, she's indicating that the number of vehicle trips per day that the home business will generate is two. Only two. Per two visits per day. The uh, size of the home business will be uh, increased from 224 square feet to 864 square feet, which is still only 13% of the total square footage of their residence. And in every other respect, this is exactly the same use that she has had since 2001. So to the extent that there may be some concern about whether uh, Ms. Evans is planning some sort of gigantic expansion simply because she's expanding her business, that's simply not true. Uh, sometimes you need more space than you counted on when you start up uh, a project. Uh, file space is at a premium, as we all know of the business. That's the purpose, to have a little bit more room. So that is the nature of the uh, home business for which uh, she is seeking approval. On to the issues at hand. Uh, as we all know at this point, uh, the crux of the decision for the board to make, now that the board has decided to make this decision, is whether the addition that my clients built is on, <coughs> on one hand an accessory structure or on the other an attached structure. If it's an accessory structure, then she cannot have a home business in that structure because uh, by definition, accessory uses, pardon me, by, ex by definition, home businesses cannot uh, be held in accessory uses, and accessory uses are detached buildings. If the building is attached, on the other hand, it is not an accessory use by definition, and therefore is the type of structure in which uh, Ms. Evans can conduct her business. Now, I've, I've heard so far uh, Dr. Chatmus describe what sounds like some precedent 
within the town for regarding connections between uh, structures that might otherwise be considered accessory uses um, as transforming those accessory uses into attached structures by means of a connection that itself requires a building permit. And I submit that that's a bright line for this case. Uh, there might be uh, harder cases for the board. There might be the, the flagstones that Mr. Smith described. Maybe there could be uh, uh, some sort of a connection that doesn't require any permit at all or a canvas tent or something like that. A bright line perhaps for this board is that these two buildings were connected. They were connected by a connection that requires a building permit and that that connection was approved in the process of granting the building permit. However, uh, what we have to deal with uh, primarily is what the ordinance says or doesn't say on this subject. And uh, I know that, uh, that, that Attorney Brogan likes to use a lot of uh, what he calls common sense and uh, uh, everyday reasoning and so forth. Um, and there's certainly nothing wrong with either of those, uh, those values. However, what we have to work with is what the ordinance says and what the law says. Unfortunately, the zoning ordinance doesn't define attached. However, uh, section 19.1.3 of the ordinance says that if there's a term that isn't defined, then that term will carry its, quote, customary and usual meaning. And the main Supreme Court, when it has attempted to give a term its customary and usual meaning, has gone to the dictionary, which makes perfect sense that hopefully a dictionary has customary and usual meanings of work. When I looked up attached in my Random House Webster's College Dictionary of 1999, the only meanings of attached were, quote, joined, connected, or bound. That is the common and usual meaning of the word attached. Using those definitions, there is no reasonable way to say that the addition in the main house of Ms. Evans and Mr. Sellers are not attached because they are joined, connected, and bound to each other by the walkway or catwalk, depending on how you want to look at it. There isn't a lot of main case law on the subject of uh, when, thing is, when a building is attached and when it isn't. We'll discuss that a little bit more as I go along. But there is at least one decision in the insurance context that says that uh, if a building is physically, if a structure is physically attached to another building, it is considered an addition to that building as opposed to a separate building. But there are better cases than that, and I'll get to that in a minute. I anticipate that Attorney Brogan will say, this isn't really a connection. It's not connected enough. Uh, it doesn't have a roof, or it doesn't have this, or it doesn't have that. If your ordinance said that in order to be connected, a connecting structure had to have those attributes, you'd have a really good argument. Unfortunately, your ordinance doesn't say that. Your ordinance says nothing about the meaning of attached except to go to the dictionary definition. If this board were to try to come up with another meaning of the word attached in the context of this appeal, it would be engaging in something that's called uh, judicial legislation, or uh, putting it more uh, commonly, making it up as you go along. There's a real temptation to do that sometimes on boards of appeals. But that's one thing that boards of appeals can't do. They can't rewrite ordinances uh, to supply language that isn't in there. I submit, how else, uh, given the dictionary definitions, could my clients have ever determined whether what they were doing was an attached structure than to go through the process that they did? Now, we've already talked about this uh, in the context of whether it's a binding decision or something that's not outcome determinative, we, we push that to the side for now. But the facts remain that my clients did go to Mr. Smith, who is the interpreter of the zoning ordinance, 
And in his opinion, as the interpreter of the zoning ordinance, this was an attached structure. Based on the language that he had to go on, that was unquestionably the correct answer. Uh, there, is no, there is no other uh, conclusion that he could legally have reached. Now there is uh, a main case within the zoning context that is pretty close to being on point. And it is called Town of Union versus Strong. And I think this is a very important case because it involved the question of whether a deck, uh, which was attached to a structure, was considered a building uh, or uh, an accessory structure or something else was considered part of the building. And I think that's a pretty debatable point. A deck, maybe you tear it off. It's not necessarily that permanent. Uh, it, it's, it's up for grabs. But the law court said, as a matter of law, that this deck was part of the structure. And uh, I asked the board to listen carefully to what the law court said, and I'm quoting from their case. Uh, this is Town of Union versus Strong. Generally, accessory structures must be on the same lot as the principal building, but they may not be attached to it. And it's interesting that the law court italicized that line, not me. So accessory structures must be on the same lot as the principal building, but they may not be attached to it. Additions made to a principal structure will not qualify as an accessory use. And dealing with the deck in particular, the law court said, you know, we could have decided this differently if we had run the law court, but they said, when the deck was joined to the house, it became an extension and integral part of the principal structure and therefore must comply with setback requirements that apply to principal structures. The court then cited a case from Oregon, Yunker versus Means, and another case from Connecticut supporting its decision, but ultimately it doesn't matter what the law court wants to rely on, they have the last word in Maine and that's what they said. They were quoting uh, in Town of Union versus Strong a, a very well-known treatise on zoning which is Patrick J. Rohan's Zoning and Land Use Controls. Uh, the last sentence that the law court had cited was the one that says, additions made to a principal structure will not qualify as an accessory use. Um, and that's uh, a, the critical uh, point for this, for this board to remember. It's, it's an absolute rule. It's a, it's a bright line, if you want to call it that. Um, uh, if it's not uh, that an addition made to a principal structure will not qualify as an accessory use. The, uh, one of the cases that the law court relied on, as I said, was Yunker versus Means, um, has some good language uh, on this point as well. And this is a case, again, that the law court thought was right. It cited it. And in Yunker, that court said, an accessory building is a subordinate building incidental to the use of the main building. If it is an integral part of the main building, it cannot be accessory. A garage or carport attached to the house has been held to be part of the house and not an accessory building when they've been connected properly. So as far as the argument that has been raised in the administrative appeal at least, I think it is very, very clear that under existing law that because these buildings are attached, there is no question that they are attached, they are joined, they are connected, they are bound by a substantial structure and one that requires a building permit, that these are attached enough uh, so that they are attached structures and for that reason a home business can be situated in that structure if it otherwise meets the review criteria, and that's for this board to decide. There's another point uh, I'd bring to the, the board's attention. Uh, it's somewhat of an aside to the question of whether there's an attachment 
whether these buildings are attached or not. And that's the question of whether attached or not, this building, the addition is an accessory use. And the definition of an accessory use requires that the, uh, the structure be subordinate and incidental to the main structure. Something that's relatively expendable in a sense, something that's uh, optional, something that the main house doesn't really need. In this case, we're not talking about a garage, uh, we're not talking about a gazebo, we're talking about a substantial structure on the first floor of which is the family library, and on the top floor of which uh, is an area that can be used for living space and for business space. This is an integral part of their home. This is an integral part of their dwelling. So that even using the definition of accessory structure without even thinking about the attachment rule, it can't be an accessory structure because it is neither incidental to uh, nor subordinate to the main part of the house. Now, it, this afternoon, there have been a lot of faxes flying back and forth uh, between the attorneys. And so I'm anticipating uh, an argument that I assume is going to be made by Mr. Brogan that, uh, that the addition, uh, let me start over again, that a home business can only be operated out of a dwelling unit and that in his view, what we have here with regard to the addition is not a dwelling unit. However, we have to go by the definitions of dwelling unit as they are set forth in the ordinance and not what we necessarily would think on our own. Under your ordinance, a dwelling unit is simply a room or group of rooms forming a habitable unit for one family with facilities used or intended to be used for living, sleeping, cooking, and eating. The definition doesn't say how those rooms have to be grouped. It doesn't say they have to be in one building necessarily. They only have to serve as a group of rooms forming a habitation for one family. Because there is nothing in that definition that requires any particular configuration of the houses, you could not use that definition to say that this, uh, that the, the Evans edition does not qualify for a home business. But, <coughs> In, in one of the, the final uh, facts forays that we, uh, or volleys that we had this afternoon, uh, Mr. Brogan brought up the point that, well, a dwelling unit has to be in a building, and a building implies that there's a single unit and not more than one building. But let's look at the definition of building within your zoning ordinance, and that is, any structure having a roof supported by columns or walls and including sheds and all attached structures, such as porches, decks, balconies, carports, and similar structures for which a building permit is required. It's been established that Ms. Evans and Ms. Sellers needed a building permit to put in the connecting walkway between these two buildings as well as to build the addition itself under this definition of building, clearly the entire structure, the entire complex is a building because all of the structures are attached to one another. Not in any sort of flimsy or ephemeral way, but by a permanent structure that it's itself requires a building permit. So to sum up, and I, this really is not a very difficult issue, given the materials and the guidance that your ordinance gives you and that the dictionary gives you. Question number one, is the addition in the main part of the house, are they joined, connected, or bound? There is no way that one can say that they are not because they are definitely connected by the cap wall. That's really as far as you need to go. But if you need to go to the law court cases, then you can ask yourself, has the addition been made an integral part of the rest of the residence by the connection of it to the main house with this catwalk or walkway? I submit that there is no other way that you could reasonably characterize what they've done here. They have not intended to push this addition off to the side or never use it or 
uh, use it occasionally or uh, you know, whenever they feel like it or when, when uh, guests come. This is as if they decided to put their living room in another building. They have the right to do that. And they have the right to decide that they want to walk outside to get there as long as they have connected the structures. Again, this, the addition is integral to the overall dwelling and therefore under main law as a matter of law is part of the structure and is not an accessory use. So use your, your past precedents that uh, Dr. Chapman uh, brought up. Use Dr. Smith's, Dr. Smith, <laughs> Mr. Smith's uh, interpretation. Use your ordinance, use the dictionary, and use the law. And the only reasonable conclusion you can come to is that this is the type of structure, whether you call it attached or non-accessory, in which a home business can be situated. Thank you, unless the board has questions. Why don't we wait until after we've heard from Mr. Brogan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think what the board has presented with is, as you might expect, opposite of what Mr. Bannon just told you. Uh, it's sort of a field of dreams thing. I guess if we build it, they will come. Uh, in this case, if you build an accessory building, you put a catwalk on it that uh, come, goes to the other building, that's an attached building. and so. You can do whatever you want to do with it as far as putting a, putting a, a, a business in there. Uh, I think uh, for Dr. Wenberg and for Ms. Carney, uh, they do feel like they have been, uh, I, w I don't want to say tricked because that might be too strong a word, but abused by the process. Because what we've heard here tonight is sort of a circular argument that started with Mr. Bannon's argument that there was no jurisdiction and then when if there is jurisdiction well of course this is not a, a separate building this is a, this is just one building and uh, that building is integral to the other building well uh, if you all have pictures and I think you do of these two buildings they are completely separate they are two separate buildings there is a, a walkway between those buildings open to the air and that is it this building, uh, and if you look at my letter of June, January 27, 2003, was built specifically to put a home business in. It was built specifically to put the home business in and to try to get around the issue of having a home business in an outbuilding, in an accessory building, because it didn't apply in the residential A zone and putting it in a successory building and try to find what we can do to make that into an attached building. The original building permit, according to Mr. Bannon, and according to the discussion he had with, with uh, Mr. Smith, not Mr. Bannon, but his clients, was we're going to put a business in this building. What do we have to do to, to figure out how to put a business in? And Mr. Smith said, well, I'm not dealing with how you put a business in, but I guess one of the ways might be to attach the building in some, in some fashion to the other building. Well, the building that was built is a barn that is used for a business. It has separate heating, it has separate plumbing, it has all separate uh, functions. And in fact, that's part of the building permit that you all have. And it is clearly not an integral part of the dwelling unit. It is not part of the dwelling unit. They don't live there. They don't eat there. They don't uh, in any way participate in their family, uh, in, in a family way in there. It's not a habit. You know um, excuse me, Ms. Evans, um, Dr. Wenberg and Ms. Carney didn't interrupt your attorney while he was speaking. Please give their attorney the courtesy of the opportunity to speak without being interrupted also. The, uh, the definition of a, ha of a dwelling unit says a habitable unit for one family with facilities used or intended to be used for living, sleeping, cooking, and eating. It doesn't meet that definition. It clearly was not made for that definition. This building was built to put the home business into. It is not an integral part of the dwelling unit. It's in a residential A zone. The residential A zone is defined as allowing residential development that is compatible with the character, scenic value, and traditional use of rural lands. That's not what's happening here. 
what has happened here is a building was built separately from the dwelling unit probably because it would be easier to have a separate unit for a business that building was built with four walls a foundation heating plumbing all of those things that would be associated with a separate building and then there was a walkway put between the two and the walkway was put in there specifically to circumvent the zoning ordinances that's it and in doing so what the applicant is saying to you is don't worry about the residential a zone don't worry about the fact that this is a separate building we put a walkway between the two it's open to the outside it's not part of the house the walkway it's a separate part you have to go from the house to this business by walking outside <coughs> but just by putting that that walkway between the two buildings and there are two separate buildings and the, f the pictures clearly show that two separate buildings by putting that walkway in there we can get around the zoning ordinances now I am not the only person who's going to say this to you tonight because there are a variety of witnesses sitting out here who have the same viewpoint I believe as I do they're living in a residential area they have children they have pets they have all of the things that people have in a residential area and they did not sign on in living in the residential A area to having someone have a business put into the into their neighborhood which is designed to have residential units and I've heard uh, Mr. Bannon say this all cost hundred and fifty thousand dollars and you have to remember that that is a choice that they made there's not we're not asking you to tear down their uh, separate building we're not asking you to move their separate building we're not asking you to do anything <coughs> to separate building all we're saying is that building is not appropriate and is not appropriate by the own zoning ordinance of this town to be used as a business thanks I get, I'll answer any questions if uh, people have them. go ahead um, now the home business is an allowed use in the RA zone in a dwelling unit correct um, and, and I'm conflicted on this myself, but I mean, we, we, we're given the fact that we do have two buildings that are connected and so on. One side can make the case that it's an attached building. Um, I guess the question I really have for you and, and maybe for your clients, maybe you can answer for them, is, is um, it's, it's a permitted use within that RA zone. Um, and there's a certain set of criteria that the applicant has to satisfy for that permitted use to go forward. Um, what is it about the use, the home business use in this case, that is objectionable to your clients? Well, the use itself is not objectionable, but the way that the, the buildings have been designed separately and uh, it, the way, because they were operating this business before out of the home, the way that the, that the they have had the zoning ordinance basically backdoored by this putative attachment between the two buildings makes it uh, makes it seem like they are being uh, abused by the zoning ordinances and by the their neighbors in in putting together a business where where you as you know from looking at the building permit itself, the building permit says it's not going to be used as a business. And then immediately upon the That's issue... because the building, the, the CEO cannot grant that authority for that. I understand, but as, as Mike said earlier, the, what, what is supposed to happen apparently for people who are living in the neighborhood when a building starts is they go and look at the building permit. And when they go and look at the building permit, it says not to be used as a business entity. So. When that happens, they don't go and appeal it because it's not being used as a business entity. And then as soon as a certificate of occupancy is issued, it is a business. So there. Yeah, but, but let me, I'm still sure. not sure. And, you know, I, I can understand some concern about the fact that from one point of view, it might seem that they tried to pull the wool over someone's eyes. I'm not sure I go along with that, but I can understand someone feeling that might have happened. But. We've also heard that they've been very upfront with the code enforcement officer throughout this whole process. Um, and I think it's a very subjective question, determination as to whether this is really attached in a meaningful way. 
but let's set that aside for a second. I'm, I'm trying to understand why your clients are generally concerned about this. It's because it's a, it is a permitted use in the zone as long as certain criteria are satisfied. My client will tell you. It, 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 if, if I may, just for a second, that's, that's a question that we have to address before right. the night's over, right. assuming we get to that stage. Uh -huh. But I think it would be helpful if at this stage we focused on the question of is it attached or not? Because if we, if we find that it is not attached, that it's in fact an accessory structure, then there's a whole element of the discussion that okay. we might not ever have. Okay, but then let me, okay, I'll, I, so my question to you would be, what would you consider an attachment? What, would what, I what form of attachment would you consider it to be? I think an attachment is an addition to the primary building. And this is not an addition to the primary building, it's a separate building. And that, that is the same thing that Mr. Bannon just told you what the law court talked about, where a deck is, a, is put onto the primary building. Uh, the words that uh, the law court used was an, it was an addition to the principal structure. That is not what this is. Uh, when uh, Dr. Chapness, am I saying your name correctly, was talking about uh, the uh, attachments. In my neighborhood, there was a, uh, a, an unattached garage, which was attached to the house through the use of a, not a breezeway, but a heated area which attached the house to the garage. In other words, you went from the house to the garage without going outside. That, to me, is an attachment to the building as opposed to some bridge which is meant apparently solely just to look like an attachment between the two buildings when in fact the two buildings are separate. There's no, no shared heating, there's no shared electricity, there's no shared anything. It's two separate buildings. My, my own experience is that an un unheated breezeway, for instance, is normally treated by lay people anyway as attaching a garage to a house. Right. And You're the, saying you would not consider that an attachment. That's correct. And uh, I think that the, in this case, it is even further than that. I mean, you look at the distance between these two buildings and you look at the the, the way that the, the two buildings are uh, connected, it can't be considered an attachment. They're not, they're not connected in any meaningful way. They're two separate buildings. And that's why... I now, can you, can you bring, help us through this thicket with some, <laughs> some legal precedents? I can. That help uh, define what a like, legally acceptable form of attachment is. Well, and, and in Maine, there is no specific definition, and, and Mr. Bannon is correct. In your own zoning, zoning ordinance, there's no specific definition. Uh, there is a case that, that, that I cited Mr. Hill to from Connecticut, the St. Paul Sisters case, where there was two separate buildings attached by an enclosed walkway, and the, law, that, the Supreme Court of Connecticut said that was, not, that was not enough to make those two buildings one. Um, I think in this situation, this kind of walkway doesn't make those two buildings one. They are separate buildings. And the concern is that if you have a residential A zone and you decide you want to put a business in and you just <coughs> erect a building, put a walkway between them of some kind and say, look, that's an attachment, then these outbuildings for, for home businesses will pop up all over the place because they meet the zoning ordinance for uh, putting in uh, an outbuilding, which we've already talked about before, but they don't meet the zoning ordinance as far as being attached buildings. They're not in any way uh, integral to each other. They're two separate buildings. They're two st they don't share any function specifically. In this case, the only function was to put an office in. And that's what it was done for. Well, and half of the building is a library, a personal library as well. Half of the building is, is a personal library downstairs. But the, again, that personal library can only be accessed through the business upstairs. What if they drywalled the walkway and put a space heater in there? I, again, I think that would be directly in circumventing the, the, uh, the, two, the, the thought that these are two buildings. Had they put a, uh, a, a realistic connection between these two buildings that was a living space, then I think that there would be a totally different argument, but they didn't. So uh, I mean, you and I can go down the little road of, of horrible hypos here. In this situation, I think that they didn't do anything that, that meaningfully attached these two buildings. But I think we have to go down that road because if we say that it's not attached 
the question is will be for mr smith what do they have to do to make it attached i think that the in order to make it attached there has to be and an integral joining of the two buildings it's not an accessory building it is an integral joining of the two buildings as one unit that didn't happen in this case i'm familiar with homes in maine as well as other places that are made up of multiple buildings with connections between them much more tenuous than, than this walkway just a paved walkway for instance so i don't i don't think the fact that home is made up of more than one building is a totally unusual situation i agree with you if, if it was a home um, but in the situation it isn't we're not talking about building a home we're talking about building a business which is well, what, what happened half of half of this second building is intended to be a business the other half is tended to be a living space yeah and, and in this situation what was done was they were according to their attorney put with this attachment so that they could circumvent the the zoning ordinances. Could I tell you it, it, no, it, not yet. But you will have an opportunity to present us with whatever you'd like. Excuse me for a second. John, when I, if and when I interrupt you, maybe you can interrupt me, but I haven't done that. I expect you to extend the same courtesy to me here that you would in a courtroom. Right. Can you just repeat what you said? No, I'm not going to repeat what no, I said. Let me, let, me, let me respond for a minute myself, because I, I, I do take issue with your wording. Um, I, you're talking about circumventing. I'm, I don't necessarily believe that they tried to circumvent anything. They tried to work within the law. And one view of what they did was they tried to, took a look at the law, what the law allowed and how it allowed it, and they tried to work with that. But they did it without, they didn't add on to the building. They, they put a separate building in. But as I said, I'm very familiar with the, with homes in Maine as well as other places where a home consists of multiple buildings, sometimes connected even more tenuously than these two buildings are. But what I think you're talking about, Mr. Keneally, is a home. You're talking about a, have, as they describe it here, a dwelling unit or a room or a group of rooms that are uh, form a uh, habitable unit for a family with facilities used or intended to be used for living, sleeping, cooking, and eating. That wasn't what was put up here. Uh, they've told you already that what they put together was a business and why they did it was they wanted to make sure that that business could be in this separate building. Uh, I don't, I understand what you're saying about having maybe a home has separate buildings. This isn't meant to be a home. Well, half of, half of it is for home use, for living use. Uh, and, and I think that's, again, it's a library. Um, it's certainly not for living, eating, sleeping if you look at the plans there there is no kitchen in this building there's no uh, bedrooms in this building there's no no but i have a very small library in my house and i consider it a very essential part of my <laughs> home so. well and, and i understand what you're saying i'm not i'm not trying to be particularly difficult i'm just saying that i think that this is not does not meet uh, what will be commonly understood I, as i'm that. trying to I'm, I'm a little bit playing devil's advocate and i realize that because we i'm wrestling with something here that we haven't dealt with before and I'm trying to understand myself the best way to deal with it. That's why I'm. And I understand that, and, and I, I understand you're trying to do your civic duty as well as your fiduciary duty to the town in determining what what you think is correct. <coughs> My interpretation of how these two buildings were put together, I think, is is borne out by what we we put together in our timeline. Uh, I I don't. I'm not misunderstanding you to say that the, that. The, you decided one way or the other. I think that the questions you ask are, are important and useful. I just don't think that this build, these two buildings meet. Let me, right let, me take, let me take one thing just one step further, and then I'll let someone else ask. Sure. Them. If they were to enclose this walkway and perhaps even heat it in some substantial way, maybe even more than a space heater, I mean, at what point do you say that it's really, it really is an attached building? I think if they were using the buildings as habitation units. In other words, they were attached in a substantial way so that they could be used for habitation between the two houses, then I think it's, it, it meets the criteria. They do have a right to a home business. <coughs> they do have a right to a home business within the parameters of a residential A zone. They don't have a right to a home business in a building that is separate from their habitation. And the reason the zoning ordinance is written that way is so that you don't create 
But that's the question I asked you. At what, at what point does the attachment become so, so substantial that you say now it is a part <coughs> of the home dwelling unit? I think when it, when it is clear that the, attach, the, that the house and the, the attached building are meant to be one dwelling unit. And that, is, that, that certainly is not even close to being clear. You understand what, I, what my argument is? I understand where you're trying to go. Um, I'm not sure that, I think the fact that it was intended from the outset to house the home business is a reason that you'll never let it be defined as an attached building. Is that correct? Well, no. I mean, I, I think the reason I wouldn't say it's an attached building because it isn't an attached building. It's not an integral no, but part. I'm saying if, it, if, the, if the attachment were made so substantial that it was an enclosed, you know, heated connection between the two buildings. I wouldn't be standing here. So you're saying that would be enough to make the connection? If, in fact, they were using it as a habit, habitable building as opposed to a home no, business. No, no. No. The home business is, in a, is a permitted use. Understandably, but it, it can't be a permitted use to start from. In other words, in a residential A zone, you start with a dwelling unit. It, that is not with a dwelling unit. It is a real substantial dwelling unit. Well, yeah, and, and they had a home business in that dwelling unit, but then they built another building and tried to make an attachment to make that other building, which is a home business, into a dwelling unit. It isn't. Dwelling unit, well, dwelling unit already, the first part of the dwelling unit <coughs> already existed. Absolutely. And, and that's where their home business was, and, and we did not have an objection to that. When they built another building and tried to make a connection between those two buildings so that it would be a business uh, and uh, separate from the dwelling unit, that's when we have an objection. Okay. I, I, I'm still wrestling with it, as I say, and I'm not sure I agree with you that you have enough basis for objection objecting to that. I, and I understand what you're saying, but I, I think the point that I'm trying to make is, and if you look at the photographs, it's fairly clear, this, the way the zoning ordinance is written is you have a residential A zone. It is meant for people.